so if you remember uh, you know so last class i think the last week okay so we have almost closed our uh, compression members then the column splices also okay so that problem and i think last week we had a tutorial also okay where you have solved on column splices so with this you know as far as this course is concerned say so the compression member is uh, point whatever we have uh, covered okay so these are the some questions i ask you like the checklist okay so which uh, you know we do after every this one so that you know if you are able to answer this then you are doing uh, fine just to assess uh, you know the yourself itself okay and now i think i think up to uh, 14 uh, so now uh, anybody tell me see what is the basic philosophy behind the uh, built up column mm. that lacings and batten so what is the why do we do that one Now, why do we do this? Why do we require lacings and battens? What is the main advantage? We use build-up columns to increase the moment of inertia. Uh, excellent. Okay. So, moment of inertia along which axis? You know, you have a major axis, you have a minor axis. So, anyway, one is fine, but other direction, whichever is weak, say. So, you make the spacing such that you know it is fine. So, excellent. Okay. And now, what is the slenderness ratio of laced and battened columns? Hmm. So, for a lacing column, what is the slenderness ratio? Hmm. So, how much you increase, you know, the slenderness ratio compared to a solid column? One point zero five. Ah, that is a five percent increase. Then battens. Hmm. 10% increase 10% increase okay so that is how you see we take why do we increase this one so why its slenderness ratio is increased now nah. so what is the reason if somebody ask you say why you are taking as 5% and 10% more say what what reason you will give to account for shear deformation yeah, excellent okay so the shear deformation will be there you know in these uh, type of columns so for that we do now nah. now whether the euler's buckling load formula is applicable to built up columns hmm. uh, this question also you see somebody ask you say, so can i use a pi square ei by l square so you know for this built up columns also now see this is related to the previous question itself okay so now euler's buckling load how we have derived that pi square ei by l square what deformations you have considered hmm. see what deformation was considered in deriving this uh, pi square ei by l square Nah. So, what was the equation you see which you solved? Nah. See, all of you are there, right? Yes, sir. Nah. So, now uh, only your voice is uh, you know coming, but others, what is happening? You see, Kishore is there, right? Kishore, then uh, I think Esvita, Mihir Chawla, Shankar Nar, and something was there, right? Uh, so yes, why it's uh, uh, so you please answer you see whether euler's buckling load formula can you use pi square ei by l square for a built up column now uh, yes or no So what did we say like you see the Euler's buckling load is based on which one you know the Euler's buckling load is based only on the bending you see m is equal to ei uh, you know d square y by you see dy square or whatever so this was the equation only bending now we have said that for a built up column so shear also becomes so the governing equation of motion itself has to be changed i showed you also you know those slides where uh, you see the equations of motion say they are entirely different when you include a uh, shear deformation also uh, where was it uh, not this one. okay lacing is here no no uh, so this is the original uh, this one now when it comes to this uh, you know the lacing columns and others say okay 
Uh, so this is the equation of, uh, you know, the equilibrium you followed. So this equation has to be used, you know, if there is a shear deformation also. And then we have told very important thing like you see how this uh, graph varies the shear stiffnesses and other things. So if shear stiffnesses is very, very high, say, then you know, so this quantity goes to zero kind of a thing. And finally, it comes back to Euler's, uh, you know, the buckling load. So now uh, for lacing columns, says, because shear is very, you know, the dominant kind of thing, say. So Euler's buckling load, technically speaking, theoretically, you can't use that pi square i by L square for uh, built up columns itself because the shear deformation has not been considered. But to simplify, say, so what our code has done is, you know, so our code says you use a pi square i by L square only to account for this extra, this one, you see. So that's why you see we increase the slenderness ratio of lacing column by 5% and the batting column by 10%. And why lacing column, you know, we 5%, 10% also because lacings, you have diagonal, you know, the elements also like this, okay. So that's why you see its strength will be, you know, it can carry so that's why i say five percent the batons are just like a beams okay so the design also you have seen so the it will have a transfer shear longitudinal shear bending movement and other things will be there so the slenderness ratio has been increased for a batten column so for answer for this question is theoretically no okay but uh, you know in the code you know if you give so many formulas confusions will be there so to simplify this say we use same uh, formula only but uh, five percent ten percent you increase the slenderness ratio okay so this is the reason and now uh, what are the steps in the design of a built-up column you know so this i have already we have seen that is you know the first thing is you, know, you have to check the individual members okay so whether they are uh, fine or not, that was the first check, you know, you would have solved in the previous uh, problem itself. Then you have to find out the spacing actually, okay. So this is the next step. Once the spacing is found out, so equating moment of inertia in both the directions. So you find out the spacing, then you have to design, you see, the individual members. So that's are this uh, lacings or battens or whatever, say, the thickness, you know, of the lacing and then length and the spacing between the lacings or the battens, you know, so this has to be decided such that there will not be no local uh, buckling or something will happen like that, okay? So then you have to do the design of the spacing, thickness of the bar, then the connections, bolts or welding or whatever say. So that has to be designed. So these are the basic steps in our uh, built up column. We have already, you know, uh, done in the tutorial and other, uh, you know, the assignments and other things, okay? And now how do we avoid a distortion in laced column? Now, question two, uh, tell me, how do you avoid distortion in the laced column? what you have to provide hmm. so what is that you provide hmm. so i have a lacing you know like this ah, so what is that you have to do to avoid distortion say hmm. so you are, if you want to avoid distortion what you have to provide uh, this also I showed you, right, in the previous uh, long back, you see, in the slides, okay? So everything is there in the slide itself. Uh, now, how do you avoid distortion? Mm, where is that lacing? Yes, lacing is here. Uh, so we have said this one, okay? And uh, now, how do we avoid a distortion? So this is what we said as a distortion of cross-section. What is that you have to do in a lacing column? Mm. So to avoid this distortion, say, what you have to do? Provide a tie plate. Ah, excellent. So you have to provide a tie plate at the top and the uh, bottom. Okay. So that is how you see we provide the lacing, uh, you know, these are tie plates. If you don't provide tie plates, say, so then, you know, you have a problem. Okay. And how do we design this uh, tie plates? Nah. So the tie plate should be, what is the design should be same as? Nah. Batons. Ah, Batten itself. Okay. Excellent. So this is how you see you have to do this uh, design. Nah. So now, uh, oh, yes. uh, now what is the main purpose of lacings and battens? What lacings and battens does, you know, whether they support the load? See, the axial, whatever compression is coming on the column, say. So they support that load or what is the, the main loads is carried by which members? You know, you are having, you see, the main members. See, these two channels, you have, then we have lacing we have. And of course, if there is a batons, batons is there, okay? Now, what is the main purpose of lacings and batons? Whether they carry the main load or what is that they do? They connect these two sections. The main purpose of is to give the... the 
skip the two sections together no ah, excellent together so that's why we don't do designs for the lacings and battens the design is only for shear actually okay so the transverse shear or something 2.5% and other things we have said now nah. now on the last, this one is very important now what does the point to in the stress reduction factor indicates you remember that point to you know in the uh, not lacings and battens in the original uh, formulas say in the is code uh, reduction factors where are they now nah. so here we are using point to now uh, you remember this one uh, what is this point to hmm. now this is point to you remember the compression member in the formula point to indicates what hmm. now what does the point to indicates now you have forgotten what is that point to indicates you see this figure also hmm. what does this point corresponds to hmm. now what is this point to you know see what is uh, if it is less than point to say what is your uh, you know the stress or whatever this fc now uh, what is happening to your buckling Uh, it's a short column to get this plant you say okay so that is why this point to be followed so this you should remember okay the point to how uh, you know what does this things indicates and others uh, so that is the most important thing now then how do we connect to two columns so like one column is here another column is here say okay so how do we connect you see uh, so we use what splice. is that uh, the column splices have to be there now what is a bearing plate hmm. you would have done last week right what is a bearing plate when you have to provide bearing plate hmm. see bearing plate when you have to provide when the columns of different size uh, different size if the column is of same size also people are putting okay so that the load will be distributed you know uh, properly but when the different sizes say so then you have to provide the bearing plate now bearing plates are designed for what loads Uh, like well, how did we design the bearing plate previous last class hmm. now uh, you remember this what was the load on the bearing plate flexural stresses now uh, flexural stresses but how did we get so you since bearing plate is a two separate two thicknesses are there say so this a we take okay that is a difference between these two column you know the sizes and others so for this you know we design the uh, bearing plate okay so this you should uh, remember the design uh, things itself now then the shear splice hmm. now shear splice what do we do hmm. it is related to here right. itself right. so where shear splice is put up it is uh, att attached to the yeah. at the right. bed so Uh, whenever there is a load say the whole compressive load or whatever it is carried by this uh, splice plate that is a bearing splice a shear is carried by this then uh, this if two different sizes are there say so this comes into picture okay so that is how this oh, now what is the slenderness ratio of splice plate hmm. this is a very important what was assumption we did in the design steps hmm. Now, so where it was uh, that slenderness ratio? You remember what is the slenderness ratio of the splice plates? Now, you can you see here? Short columns. Now, so what is the slenderness ratio? Short column means it is slenderness ratio is point two or less. Now, no, no, zero almost if followed. Of course, okay. point two less that is as per, but that is how we say these are assumed. Okay. so this uh, you followed right so if you are able to answer if you know able to find out the answers for all these things say that means you know if people are doing fine so other questions i don't know you please check uh, you know the yourself okay so anyway so with this we will close our uh, column so we go to the uh, next uh, you know the thing that is uh, you see the beams basically okay uh, so now uh, you know so that is the next unit okay so now we have done tension members then uh, compression members next comes uh, beams now one thing is uh, you know you are uh, increasing but the design complexity is also increases actually tension members you know 
it was very simple you see p by a only area was there tensile strength or you see that gross yielding strength or something like that it was all very easy only so we were looking for area was our main design variable for tension now when it came to compression members say area also came into picture then we had moment of inertia radius of gyration slenderness ratio you know all those things you know they came into picture now when it comes to beams say so things becomes much more complex and here the design variables you know the increase so now for beams is what is the most important design variable hmm. now what is the most section modulus uh design variable bending moment is fine but there is a section model that is this uh, z actual and since here uh, for beams is in our is 800 we are going for limit state design that plastic things and other things also so here we will be having two shear modulus as also one is a shear uh, elastic shear modulus plastic shear modulus then shape factor you know many you know variables comes into picture here then the buckling of the beams say this also is a very very important thing okay the buckling of the beams you see the lateral torsional buckling then you know the shear you see the shear may be dominant generally in beams what is the most dominating force beams are subjected to what type of uh, what is the, what are the internal forces in the beams hmm. you have done in mechanics right whenever there is a beam given loads what do you find out shear and flexor no excellent so shear force bending moment so here also suppose if, uh, of course among shear and bending which is the one widely used now for design which is the most important thing for us of course both are important only but sometimes mostly you follow that right? bending moment only you know we consider the shear deformations or shear things are all you know Uh, very small you followed right we neglect that is how you know that plane sections remain plane you remember right uh, because shear deformations you see we ignore of course shear stresses we find out but generally be bending moment is the most uh, important thing for uh, beams but sometimes you know the shear also will be very very dominant so when the shear is also very dominant say so then you have to check both the cases you know separate cases are in so so many things will come into beams so the design becomes complex of course it is not complex but the steps will uh, increase so you may have to do so many checks like you know for tension members maybe two checks you would have done gross strength then the tensile uh, kind of a thing but when it comes to compressive strength say, some more checks are there like slenderness ratio and other things may be there but when it comes to beams say so your design steps you know the increases basically okay that is the most important thing so anyway so the beam uh, you know so the coming this so now to define what is meant by beam say so this is just a typical definition it just a structural member so one dimension is uh, you know very very long compared to the other dimensions so that is the most important thing in the beams so when one dimension is longer than the other dimensions say so you were uh, you know that euler bernoulli beam theory can be used if followed it the plane sections remain plane uh, you know and so the all these assumptions you can use and you can collapse the entire beam to a, a centroidal axis actually okay so this is how a beam is represented a 3d beam collapses to simple one line okay so in our euler bernoulli that beam theory and all the plane cross sections are all the uh, points here actually okay in this euler bernoulli so the plane cross sections are rigid so this is an assumption you see so we you do use in euler bernoulli beam theory so they are rigid connections and you know you know right that they remain plane then they remain always perpendicular to the neutral axis say. then you know your shear is also gone so you have that m by i you know that f by y you follow it that formula comes into picture uh, so the same thing we do uh, now the sections of beams you followed it are subjected to shear and bending uh, you know so these are the most two most important things on the beams that is a bending moment and then you see we have a shear force now in our uh, steel the thing or many textbooks if you see people will be using variety variety of names all are same only but uh, you know depending on you see their usage and other things people use but the design is same so like this word joist you know some people say steel joist you design a steel joist so joist is nothing but a beam only 
So it is just like it's a less important closely spaced beams you followed it. Right? We call them as you know the joist basically. Then we have a purlins word is used. So purlin is also beam only, but when you are using a roof trusses, right? So you know the cycle shed or whatever uh, trusses are there, say in the factories and others. So we use the word the beams are known as a purlins, but the design is same only. Okay. Then we have a rafter beam also. So it is also beam only, but supporting purlins is we call that as a rafter. Then lint. Lintels, lintel beam, we say all of you in your houses also, right? Whenever you are constructing, so over the door, window opening also, we use this type of lintel beams. Then girts, you know, this is also another uh, technical word. Some cladding in industrial buildings, so girts they use. Then stringer beams also. So they use, I think, in uh, you know the plate deck slab and other things will be there. Then we have spandrels, you know. So there are many words which we use actually, okay, today, uh, you know, in our uh, construction. But all of them comes under uh, design of a spandrel or a design of a stringer, design of a lintel. Say everything same design as a beam itself. So these are all just the words which are widely used in the industry, okay, joist. Berlin. So if somebody asks you, say you design a lintel beam. So designing a lintel beam is same as this beam, whatever we are going to discuss right now. If somebody asks you to design a stringer beam or a joist, say so steps are same only, formulas are also same only. So you have to assume all of them are ordinary followed, right? The beams itself. And one here, the most important thing is when you are having a very very large size uh, beams, say we call them as girders, okay, the plate girder. So this you know comes into picture. So the design of plate girder is you know different, okay. So that we will handle uh, you know separate uh, unit. After these uh, beams, we will go to that one. So girders are this one, but all these things comes under uh, the beam design only. Okay, this is the most important thing. So girder is different, beam is different. Of course, girder is also beam only, but you know the design is steps are slightly you know the different for the girders. So these are the from the steel tables to say we have right the building blocks okay like I section, channel section, all other things, all of them can be used for the beams. So the most important section which is widely used for beams like in ordinary buildings and others to say is the I beam okay widely used you know the beam member. See why uh, I sections are very popular in beams. What is the advantage of I section? See, generally, whenever you have a beams, everybody prefers I sections only. Now, why do we prefer I sections for beams? Why don't we do rectangular cross sections? Hmm. So, why do uh, section modulus or uh, moment of inertia you follow because you know that bending stress is you know m by z. So you follow right. So this matters a lot actually. So if z is very very high, say then the stress will be small. So and z depends on uh, moment of inertia i by y kind of thing. So this i say the moment of inertia is more than z will be more than stress will be less. So that's why you see these uh, you know these. Uh, I sections are widely preferred in beams. So then sometimes the channels also we use. Okay, like I told you, right? We have a joist, purlin, rafter, and other things. So you know, uh, ordinary purlins, if you want to design, say small, small, you know, sheds and this, maybe angle sections also can be used actually. But okay. So then sometimes see, built up sections also we do. Like you see, the required the loads are very heavy, and if the section modulus also required is very large, you say you may be not we will not be getting that type of section modulus from our uh, steel tables. So you use you know you do some kind of a welding, you know, you attach some uh, you know some other steel flat or something like that. So you make your own section, you increase it section model as you do. So these are all built up you know, sections like this one also we use and sometimes rolled beams like you see two beams is a so two I sections you know you join them are uh, you know rolled channels then you know T plate plate and then T plates. So these are all built up sections. So variety variety things are uh, used in practice like you see you take angle section you take a plate and then you make your own uh, you know the beam itself okay so like this very widely things are widely used and sometimes you know in our thing you can use these type of beams also you can see this is an i section which is not symmetric so this flange side width is different this flange width is different also so this will be embedded in the concrete slab so like that also you know composite sections we say so these are also widely used for uh, beams now these are some guidelines actually Okay, some like you say what do you want to use say. So there are some guidelines are available. So like for example, if you are having a span three to six meters span only say, 
and let us say these are all lightly loaded beams like a roof purlin or a sheeting rail or something like that so you can use an angle section so this is a guideline so this angle section can be used as a beam you know if the span is not more than you say 63 to 6 meters or something like that and the loads are also very very small so like you say cycle shed or maybe you know where there is not much din so you can go for angle section now if the span is 1 to 30 meters say then uh, you know the roll dissections have to be used okay so these are some guidelines are there now if it is a you know 6 to 60 meter very long spans and light loads are there say okay so instead of going for angle we go for castellated beams i will show you what do you mean by castellated beam now if the span is much much higher say 10 to 100 and you have to carry a very very high we loads to say we use a plate girders so plate girder design is entirely different from beam okay then uh, if the span is much more longer say we use this uh, box girders so long spans heavy loads are there say so we use this box so these are like you see some kind of a guidelines okay so uh, which section i should use for what purpose i should use so there are a nice uh, guidelines are available so this is the castellated beam you can see here uh, so this is a castellated beam so have you seen anywhere this type of beams you can see here so this is a beam Uh, inside you know you have uh, you followed it the space okay so this is a castellated beam they say so these type of things are used you know for very very long uh, spans is a 6 to 60 meter uh, you know and loads are light you can see it is only supporting you see there is one asbestos sheet or some sheet above so you know so these type of for very long long spans instead of going for angle section we go for this castellated uh, beams also then there is a typical plate girder okay it's a huge uh, you know for bridge decks and others we use it. and this is our box girder okay so this also is used uh, you know as a beam you have seen right this type where are you seeing this nowadays uh, frequently which of them you are seeing frequently no. uh, like metro you have seen right metro constructions which one they are using right now see like in our chennai metro box or uh, box girders and they do right they manufacture in you know, a piece by piece by piece they nicely join you know one by one one by one and then you see they are using so this is widely used for i think what is uh, metro and other things plate girders are also used like flyovers you know if you go say to any flyover or wherever you know you will see these type of structures so castellated beams you will see in industry of course it cannot carry very high load but uh, long spans say so these type of beams can be used here and of course the idea is very simple because beam you know the more mass should be concentrated at the edges so that your moment of inertia uh, increases okay so these are the things now before going into the design of beams say one should have an idea of suction modulus okay so anyway all of you know this one so suction modulus has to be you should know all of you suction mod and there are two things are there one is uh, elastic suction modulus which all of you know and then plastic suction modulus also because our design is uh, you know the limit state design say so this also you know it becomes very important for uh, as itself then another thing is you see the shape factor okay which is anyway the ratio between uh, you know zp by zde kind of thing so this also you see one has to have an idea uh, you know before going into the design process okay so now let us see this uh, case now this is a cantilever beam so i have a cantilever beam like this and the concentrated load is acting uh, here so the same figure say okay and it is a rectangular cross section we have taken here so this is the uh, graph here okay so now uh, for a cantilever beam say where is the bending moment is maximum at what place joint at the fixed end okay so that is if w is this one l is a span so this is a bending moment diagram okay all of you know so the, here the bending moment is you know the maximum uh, bending moment comes into at the uh, joint itself now if you try to plot the bending stress distribution say from that formula is m by i uh, you follow it right? f by y i uh, so stress is, uh, is m y by i okay so this is my bending stress here so this y uh, this if so if you try to plot uh, you know this bending stress and other say so all of you know the bending stress is you know like this so top fiber compression or tension or whatever so bottom one will be like this so this is my bending stress distribution neutral axis everything all of you have heard in your uh, mechanics materials okay so now uh, you see so obviously say so the compression portion the tension portion you should so you are having a two equilibrium so one is uh, you know the force equilibrium say 
so anyway on this beam there is no axial force which is acting on the beam so obviously sigma you know the f has to be zero so which means you see the compressive thing and tension things so both of them should be you see same kind of a thing so automatically you see this is a bh by a into f of r whatever you have then this uh, bending moment say that is a bending moment you can find out from uh, this expression also that is f by z and other things also but you can also find out like you see the bending things say you know like this one no so Ah, so now before, so if you take this is my section say that is F Y. So you know, so C E T B H by four into F Y. So the bending moment say. So C into this liver arm basically. So this is my liver arm. So I have a centroid here say of this portion and this portion. So this is my you know the liver arm. So this becomes is a two H by three for ordinary the elastic uh, case itself. And this is my B H cube by six actual. Okay, so this is what we call as the elastic section modulus. You can find out from uh, you know the, like you see two H by three that compressive force and this one also you can do, or you can do that we already know right I by Y uh, you know that expression you see that also one can use in the elastic uh, domain. So here what happens is you see so already I told you so like you see as the load keeps on uh, increasing say so the fibers are first so this section. Uh, the top fiber say if it is less than f of y the yield strength of the material so the whole section will be elastic now once uh, f increases equals to f of y that is you know yielding starts say so the top fiber because the stresses are very high the top fiber the bottom fiber they try they start uh, you know the yielding itself now as you keep on increasing the load say so then you know this yielding you see this uh, propagates uh, the stresses you know they redistribute among themselves so this whole fiber plastification you see it happens and then uh, you know it goes something like this now after you keep on increasing the load say after some point what happens is all the fibers would have uh, plastified basically okay the whole hitch by the whole uh, beam will plastify and obviously what happens uh, so the whole section is plastified so what happens at this junction now what happens? We I discussed long back also. What happens when the whole section is a plastified say? Elastic nah. hinge is formed. Mm. So the plastic hinge gets uh, formed. Excellent. Okay. And then of course the beam, you know, the collapses. So this is how you see the uh, generally you see the bending failure of a beam say. This is how it happens. So initially it will be like this. Then slowly yielding starts from the top. And the stresses gets redistributed and it comes to keep on coming down and finally you know everything uh, plastic phase plastic hinge forms so once plastic hinge forms then what what is the definition of plastic hinge now what's the difference between plastic hinge and ordinary hinge hmm. now i have told moment you the definition also the moment is hmm. moment is non zero but constant no. So ordinary hinge means bending moment zero, but plastic hinge means you have a constant bending moment actually. Okay, so that is a difference between these two. So that is how you know this collapses. So now this is anyway the section modulus in ordinary elastic range. Okay, so if you have to F5 just this one, so this becomes our ordinary section model. That is a BH cube by six. It's very easy. You know, you followed it. So you just you find out the force. So compression tension will be the liver arm is 2 H by 3. So you multiply automatically you will get this uh, thing and the area also you can easily find out the compressive areas. It is a triangle basically. Okay, so triangle uh, areas is nothing but half of the. Uh, so this is H by 2. This is B say that width of the beam. So the square area will be B into rectangle if you take B into H by 2. So triangle is half of that one. So that becomes, you know, uh, BH by 4 into FY. So this is a force. So BH by 4 into FY. And then, uh, you know, so you have to find out the liver arm. So liver arm is, is 2H by 3. So you will get BH cube by 6 actual. Okay. So this is what we call as, you see, the elastic, uh, you know, the modulus. Because, you know, here not plastification has not yet started. Only the top and bottom fibers, they have reached almost very, very close to the uh, yield strength. Now, uh, when it comes to the next state, say slowly, you know, the plastification has started. It has come down. OK, so it is something like this. So the stresses are getting redistributed and then it goes. Now, if you want to find out the section modulus or if you want to find out the uh, capacity, say so now here uh, you have to do two times actual. So this much portion is a plastified. OK, so this portion is a plastified. So this portion is plastified, but still uh, this is in the, this one. So if you want to find out 
the you know the bending capacity or whatever say you have to do two times one for the plastified region other for the elastic region so you have combination from this combination from uh, that also same lever arm can be so like this you see you can calculate so this is a rectangular cross section say so this portion has plastified okay uh, so the depth of the beam is d so this portion has plastified this portion is still elastic actually okay so now you can easily find out this so now to find out the bending capacity of this beam say so now so this is a plastified region okay this is also plastified region okay so you have to find out c1 t1 both of them are same anyway so now this is multiplied by its lever arm that is a1 okay so this is a component which comes from the plastic thing now we have elastic thing also that is this uh, triangle here okay so one triangle one triangle here also so this portion say okay so this portion so this also you have to find out so the area is a c2 say okay and this area is a t2 so c2 multiplied by a2 so this is a a2 is a lever arm basically so this you add the component coming from plastic region coming from this one so you will get the bending cap it is a straight forward you see so the compressive for the area of this one is you know so b into e into f of y so this is the area of this one but area of c to say so this is it's still a triangle okay so this width you have to find out d minus 2 e by 2 into b into f of y so this two comes from is a uh, triangle a rectangle say half of that one you know that comes so this is the area of c to now you find out the lever arm also so a1 is a d minus e and a2 is a 2 by 3 into d minus 2 e so this 2 by 3 comes because you are handling a, a triangle kind of uh, things it's the centroid and other things is all of you know so if you sum up these two say so you will get the bending capacity so which is given by this you see the expression okay so e is anyway the zone of uh, you know the plastic zones the, the plastic zone or whatever say so the plastic zone depth okay so this is my bending capacity of my plastic zone depth so here the and of course d is anyway the total depth of the beam and other things are there so e is a parameter actually so now if you see this uh, things how uh, this bending capacity is depending on this depth of the plastic zone hmm. how they are related mag m and e hmm. what is the relationship between m and uh, depth of the plastic zone how they are linked you see this expression now how they are linking there a linear relationship or how they are related both of them second degree they are related second degree ah uh, second degree or quadratic is e square basically you followed right that's why so what does it tells you na uh, so what is the most important thing you will find out here hmm. so if you see this expressions how bending moment is varying in the beam for cantilever hmm linearly linearly but uh, plastic hinge that depth say depth of that hinge or whatever that plastic region how it is varying with bending moment quadratic quadratic so you can see here this is a quadratic thing you followed so this uh, you know this is how you see it handles it. so basically what happens in a cantilever beam is the bending moment is very very high at this place so here the hinge forms first near the portion but before hinge has formed this say automatically this plastic region also spreads actually okay this spreads like this in this direction so here uh, you know so this place or this place if you see say so the depth of the plastic zone basically that is that e so this e whatever you are having here so automatically here that what is the depth of the plastic zone here at this uh, section hmm. at the fixed e and what is the depth uh by by whole thing by two. whole thing has got plastified you followed right so this is how is so now that is anyway that is this thing so now uh, if you come to this region say so the everything has uh, plastified it is very simple so you know the area is nothing but now b into h by 2 itself okay the area of compressive portion b into h by 2 and then uh, you know you find out the lever arm say okay between these two the lever arm you just find out so finally this turns out to be you see bh square by 4 so fy into zp so zp is you see bh square by 4 actually this is a very important thing now ze that is elastic section modulus that is before yielding say that is this proportion okay so we got as uh, what was the expression na nah. bh cube by 6 basically okay bh cube by 6 so this is elastic section modulus this is a plastic section modulus so the ratio of these two will give me the shape factor 
is a very very important concept in uh, you know the steel design essentially for the beams so what is what is my, now we no, tell me sir z p and z d are not dimensionally in the same number so they are same number right so b h square by 4 uh, here also b h oh okay no so you wrote b square. see here uh, oh here i think so somewhere i think there is a mistake has happened okay okay sir ah uh, somewhere but anyway finally they will be same only so uh, we will be, you know it should be same only okay so bh by 2 is the area then somewhere i think we missed no uh, but it their dimension is same only okay I'll okay sir okay See, BD square by six only. I think there maybe we made a no no. Sorry, here I think there is a mistake. Okay. See, BH cube by see the moment of inertia is what BH cube by twelve, right? Yes. Yeah. See here there is a problem. See BH is there two H or BH square. Okay. I think textbook I copied there. Fellow so maybe mistake. BH square by six only. Okay. So this is wrong. No. BH square by six only. So finally the shape factor is how much we have got as one point five. and uh, now you tell me what is that uh, you know what does it tells us no uh, shape factor is 1.5 so physically what does you what is your comment here no uh, so what, what does it tells you the plastic one is more than the section one so plastic one is zp so zp is 1.5 times zde uh, so what does it tells you physically meaning of this one hmm. plastic hinge moment is 1.5 times the uh, so that means a beam has how much extra strength half of the Uh, uh, elastic. Fifty percent. Okay, so 50%. So the beam generally, as already I told you, right? Our problem is, you know, what is meant by failure for us? So for steel, we have drawn the this diagram, right? It goes something like this. Uh, you know, we had elastic uh, Fy was there, then strain hardening and other things we have seen. But anyway, we are restricting ourselves to Fy itself because you know the serviceability, you know, that criteria also comes into picture. So although you know the elastic thing, whatever if you are doing designs, you have already 50% reserve strength is there in the uh, you know the rectangular cross section. You know that is how it has to be interpreted. So the shape factor tells you the reserve strength or the extra strength before you know the plastification or whatever you follow it. Right? So that is how we say this shape factor becomes very very important and it tells you the unreserved reserved strength in a beam. You see. after yielding has uh, started so very very important and here as already i told you how the hinge uh, plastic hinge depth varies now nah. so this is the same thing now it is a simply supported beam okay a concentrated load at the center so this is a bending on diagram all of you know that's a linear uh, you know the bending on diagram here so now uh, you see how the hinge is varying how the hinge varies with bending moment now nah. depth of the what? hinge that is e Nah, so e you followed it e how it varies we have seen it varies in a quadratic fashion and then you also can find out the yield zone you know the length of the yield zone of course this is not so important but length of the yield zone say that is how much portion uh, you know if the plastic hinge forms here say so because plastic hinge forms here the whole section gets plastified but at the same point of time so plastification also slowly spreads along the uh, length also so once it everything gets plastified say so you can find out the width of this uh, zone also it's very easy you know you can find out you see by using the equal triangles and other things also so this length of the plastic zone is you follow it right? l by 3 approximately okay for simply supported beam you can easily find out you see so you can find out you know that uh, similar triangles say mp by me all of you know so you, uh, what is mp by me hmm. so this is fy into zp this is fy into zde so this this cancels zp by zde for rectangular cross section so what is zp by zde hmm. now for rectangular cross section what is zp by zde that is shape factor hmm. yes now uh, 1.5 so you can easily find out actually okay so like where uh, you know the yielding starts and then you can easily calculate approximately it turns out to be l by 3 that is the length of the yield zone for uh, this uh, cross section itself 
So now if you are having a T section, say, now how do we find out my elastic section modulus? How do I find out my plastic section modulus? Also, because as I told you, right, in our uh, steel uh, things, say, we have I sections are there, rectangular cross sections. We don't even use in steel. You follow it right? because you know uh, uneconomical or something. So T sections, I sections we use. So if you take in uh, T sections, it is not a symmetric. You know, right? The area is not uh, this one or something like that. So now generally what happens is because of what, uh, C has to be equal to T, say the compressive zone, tension zone, both have to be equal kind of a thing. So generally, the, so this uh, this this is nothing but and when there is a plastification, say slowly everything gets plastified. So this plastic axis. So this generally neutral axis you would have heard. So neutral axis means where stresses are. Uh, what do you mean by neutral axis? Yeah, yeah. Uh, see in your mechanics of metals. So what do you mean by neutral axis? Zero stress. Uh, zero stress. Zero. Uh, uh, this is a zero stress we call neutral axis but when it doing the plastic design say so now this portion you follow right the whole section has got plastified and this area that is a compressive force here the tensile forces say both of them have to be same kind of a thing you should get okay so c should be same as uh, t itself so this plastic axis we call this one so this is also known as you know, the equal area axis also Okay, so this is also equal area axis also, some one uh, is a plastic axis. So plastic axis means you know, it is not stress zero or something like that, but uh, you know the area is same on the top and the bottom. So this is the meaning of this expression. Okay, so the area is uh, you followed right. So this area, this area, say both of them are same. So this we call as this is the plastic axis. So plastic axis, it may be similar to neutral axis also, some uh, cross sections, but the area above, uh, area below has to be same actually because anyway the force equilibrium has to get satisfied. So this has to be same. So now for T sections, say. So now you are having area. So A1 is this one, then A2 we have, then A3 you followed, right? The area neutral axis is here, all of you know this one. So now for uh, to find out this one, say, the tension has to be same as the uh, compression. Of course, this problem is a little bit complex because the yield stress in tension, yield stress in compression is also different, but in steel, both of them will be same only, just for the, you know, the hypothetical case we are just showing. So this is from the force equilibrium. The top and bottom has to be same. So, which means you know the uh, Fy and the tensile yield strength multiplied by area and tension, compressive this one multiplied by area and the compression. So they have to be same. Suppose if both of them are uh, same, say Fy to Fyc, the, of course they are same only. Then obviously you see AT is equal to AC. So this is possible only the total area say of the material divided by two. So this is what we call as this the plastic axis. Okay. So the uh, area says, so now if I want to find out the plastic axis, what I have to do is, so I know the total area of my material. So now I have to find out the place where, you know, the area becomes exactly, you see the half, okay, the top and bottom area should be exactly same. So this becomes automatically the plastic axis. So this is how we locate plastic axis in a, for any given uh, cross section. So you, you know the total area divided by two. Now you find out, okay, so where from the depth from here say, okay, how much will be the depth such that, you know, the top area, the bottom area has to be set. So there is a guideline. Now, once I know this uh, plastic axis, uh, that is the plastic axis or the equal area axis. Now I find out my, this, you know, the uh, section modulus, a plastic section modulus and other things. So for T sections, I have a web, I have a flange, you follow it. So I will be having, you see, the C1 will be there. Then I have uh, C2 will be there and we have this uh, tensile things will be there. So we write like this. So C1 into Y1 bar, that is a liver arm from the equal area axis. Then C2 into Y2 bar. So this also we take here. Then we have T times, you see, Y3 bar itself. See, previously what we were doing here, when the uh, sections was uh, symmetric, so what was our liver arm? Can you see here? The liver arm was? No. Nah. Now, when the things were symmetric, how did we calculate? No. See, compression was there, tension was there. Liver arm was simply we used to say C into A. That is how we calculate actually. A is nothing but distance between C and T. But now because it's a T section, because of say, symmetry and other issues are there. So now you can see the uh, our liver arms or whatever are just computed from the equal area axis itself. Okay, So C1 into Y1 bar, C2 into Y2, T into Y3 bar because of unsymmetry or whatever, you know, in this set things. So this you will find out A1 into Y1 bar A2 
AFYC, FYT. So these are our uh, terms. Right? And of course, if YC, y, you know, if FYC yield strength is same in tension as well as in the compression say so then finally you know you can uh, do like this and a by 2 this expression comes and zp into f of y so this is how we calculate the plastic section model as for these sections now for i section say which is the most important for us so you know uh, it is very simple but the only thing is you know yeah because you know the flange area is different web area is different so we have a issue so this is a flange area okay so this is my flange area then this is my you know the web area or whatever the total so this is my total uh, compressive force say so c2 then uh, c1 okay so the my becomes so a1 into y1 bar okay that is the area then a2 into y2 bar multiplied by fy so c1 is anyway fy into a1 and c2 is fy into a2 okay the web portion so plus we have you know the a3 y3 bar and a4 y4 bar if it is a symmetric uh, thing then both of them will be same like a1 will be same as you know the a3 a2 will be same as uh, a4 also okay so this also you can find out or you can do this way if it is symmetric cross sections instead of taking y1 bar y2 bar so these things have been taken from the uh, this axis that is a equal area axis otherwise you can take if it is symmetric say so you can take simply c1 into t1 this distance also you can take directly but if it is not unsymmetric, say, then you have to do individually, you know, the movement about this uh, equal area axis. So if you substitute all those breadth of the flange, width of the flange and other things, so this turns out to be my uh, plastic section uh, modulus for an I section. So these for ZZ axis, this is for other, uh, you know, the direction. So this axis also you can easily find out along YY axis, say, okay. So this also same concept. So top one, bottom one, you nicely divide and then you find out the contributions. So this is my section modulus in other direction also. And these are the uh, shape factors. So already, you know, of course, in the steel code, they don't give. But if you see any textbooks, say, you know, Dugal book or any textbook in the appendix, they give, okay, these uh, shape factors also. So for all I sections, say, what are the shape factors? Uh, can you see here? Uh, shape factors lie from where to where? See what is the shape factor for MB100, ISMB 100B? What is the shape factor? Now, what is the shape factor here? 1.26. 1.12. Uh, what do you mean by this one? How much reserve strength it has? 13 percent. Uh, uh, but rectangular cross section? 50 percent. 50% it has. Now you can see the shape factor tells you how much reserve extra strength you know it has. Okay. Now suppose if you take circular cross section, say solid circle, its shape factor is 1.7. You follow. Then if you take a diamond, say this type of cross section, a square only, a a a a. Okay. This cross section is like this. Say. Its a shape factor will be, and it is solid only. So for solid circular cross section, this will be two basically. You followed almost uh, double it will be also so these are for the i sections for channels also you know one can easily calculate they are given in the text you can also calculate from those uh, you know the expressions so 1.17 1.15 like that you see these numbers comes into picture so the shape factor is a very very important design variable for uh, beams apart from of course plastic section modulus is there but the ratio of plastic section modulus to elastic section modulus gives me this uh, shape factor. So this is a very, very important thing which uh, design variable we will be using in our uh, design. OK, so I will stop here. We will continue in our uh, next class. Now, yes. Okay. So if you have any questions, you can ask. Me.